Thank you very much and a great honor and privilege to be able to spend the next five minutes with you, sharing with you a journey that I believe uh, is better explained uh, the way Arun had captured it, and that is really addressing and satisfying a challenge that Australia has faced with, and that is how do we best address this growing demand for what we refer to as plant-based proteins in Asia. I'm going to focus on two of those tropical legumes, chickpea and mung bean, both of which are grown predominantly in Queensland. In fact, 80% uh, of all mung bean in Australia is grown in Queensland, and 60% of chickpea, both the desi and kabuli varieties, are grown in Queensland. As Arun had pointed out, uh, we see, as the rising income levels occur in Asia, that the consumers are actually demanding more for the actual plant-based proteins or proteins in general. It's quite interesting in that uh, while there's the global pro uh, production of uh, legumes across the world is around 35 million tons, and India actually consumes around 35% of this, the important thing is that India still goes ahead and imports a significant amount of those pulses from across the world, and the majority of Australian products actually end up in India and or the Indian subcontinent. We believe that that appetite is insatiable and is growing in leaps and bounds. If you take a look at this graph that uh, is on the far right of the slide, it basically shows you the distribution of where our products actually end up with, uh, end up in, in, in terms of uh, chickpea in, in this particular case. Now, what is not evident is that Australia is the world's number one exporter of chickpea in the world. Now, what this means is that the majority of the products that we produce actually gets exported and little of it is consumed domestically. While I consume chickpea at least two or three times a week, most of the products that I consume are actually produced in Australia, value added across, brought back into Australia and consumed here. We do believe that there's an opportunity for that value adding to occur locally, while at the same time actually increasing that market opportunity that exists, which is in the Indian subcontinent and in other parts of Asia as well. The industry, if you take a look at the statistics, was just about 10 years ago around a $50 million industry. And I'm happy to report that in the chickpea particularly, this has now grown to about 550 million. There is an opportunity to grow this further because it's an important, important part of our northern farming system, but there are challenges. And the challenges are largely biotic and abiotic stress tolerance. And we believe that we could actually help and assist in that process. If you just take a look at the market trends and where our products have been going to, you'll notice that with India, Bangladesh particularly, and this is part of the Indian subcontinent, it has increased significantly over the last two seasons. And uh, this is actually not going down, but rather going further up. Take a look at mung bean on the other hand. Again, 98% of our products gets exported, and the majority of this actually gets exported into the Indian subcontinent and in Asia. And if you take a look at the 2013-14 uh, growing season, the industry was valued at around 60 to 70 million. I've just spoken to the CEO of Pulse Australia on Friday, and I was told that the last season was quite a bumper season in that we have expanded it even further to a $100 million industry. And I believe that the opportunity to grow this into several hundred million dollars is really there if we could address the challenges that our farmers are experiencing. If you take a look at the Tropical Pulses Initiative in Australia, and at QUT specifically, we have actually identified five major areas that we would like to address. And the thing that stands out about this approach is that it doesn't just involve a single-pronged approach, but rather it involves the use of plant breeders. So we are using innovative strategies that we could accelerate breeding programs. We're also looking at crop modeling strategies. With that is, if we are changing the genetics and enhancing stress tolerance, which are the geographical areas that we could expand this industry into? And hence, the G by E by M is a really powerful tool that we are finding very useful. But if we look ahead, it's important for us to also have and build some competitive advantage. If you look at where our products end up, anemia is a huge challenge. And if we could help address and increase the bioavailability of iron and zinc, for example, in our products, particularly in this case, chickpea, we believe that in the next five to seven years, our products could actually be not just bio fortified, but we will also be able to satisfy the demand for it as well. I will also share with you some results that we have actually obtained around enhancing stress tolerance as well as disease resistance. For the past three years, we have lost up to 50% 
of our chickpea crop to Botrytis cinerea. And we believe that in the strategies that we have used, we have actually obtained both stress tolerant, heat, drought stress, as well as uh, Botrytis resistance in our chickpea. This is an example of a novel chemical pretreatment that we have been administering in partnership with a company. What you're seeing is an X-ray tomography, which is like a CT scan of roots that are grown in cylinders where there's nutrient deficiency. And with the treatment of 5 millimolar and 10 millimolar ATW1124, we could enhance root architecture significantly. We have been able to undertake trials at both Glasshouse as well as at Field, and our most recent Field trial, which unfortunately it rained in the last uh, month before the harvest occurred, and hence we are repeating this now in a rainout shelter. But that said and done, we have seen, based on the uh, statistical analysis that we have undertaken, a 20% improvement in the harvest index with the application of this particular naturally occurring chemical that we have, been partnered, we have partnered with uh, Plant Solutions Australia on. This is really uh, fresh off the lab. Uh, we have developed over the past two years, uh, right up until T4 generation transgenic plants, expressing genes from a native Australian resurrection plant, where we have been able to demonstrate resilience and stress tolerance against Botrytis cinerea. So what you're seeing here is the blue uh, colored leaves are really due to tripan blue, which stains dead tissue. So we exposed both non-transgenic and transgenic material to a very severe dose of Botrytis cinerea. Normally experiments are done with about 10 to the power of five uh, spore count. We double that to 10 to the power 10. And you see at the bottom, uh, basically all our transgenic plants, and these are four different uh, lines that are showing significant resistance to Botrytis. This is using innovative approaches that will allow us to reduce the loss that we have experienced over the last three years. The other issue is really around iron uh, anemia uh, and, and iron biofortification. I think this picture actually paints a very sorry state across the world. This is not just a developing world issue. This is an issue that affects both the developed world as well. Because of the kind of diet that we have, anemia is a huge challenge and the World Health Organization has identified this as one of the major challenges going forward. We are using a multi-pronged approach Picking up on the lessons that we have obtained from the, uh, the iron biofortified rice as well as iron biofortified bananas, and using a strategy that we believe will actually demonstrate enhanced iron bioavailability in particularly chickpea in this case, and hopefully to other tropical legumes as well, putting us in a very competitive position in the period that lies ahead. So we have already over the past two years just generated transgenic lines that actually have much higher iron content than we have actually seen in any of the chickpea. This is the team that's behind all the work. It's a fantastic team that involves a multidisciplinary approach, which is what Arun emphasized, involving crop modelers, plant breeders, and actually geneticists, as well as people who are involved in root architecture and soil interactions, but more importantly, biotechnologists as well. I will stop there and hope that uh, the message is quite clear that there are markets out there that we could tap into and I think it's important that we work with industry to help address those challenges.